This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. Howdy! Howdy! Is that really it? (laughs) Howdy! Howdy! Much better. From Microbe TV... This is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 502, recorded on June 28th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today we are recording in College Station, Texas. We are at Texas A&M University at the Center for Phage Technology. And we are on our way to Austin to record another episode <laughs> tomorrow. Joining me today on my left, Rich Condit. Howdy, Vincent. Welcome. Oh, see, I, howdy, it just comes out naturally. <laughs> You're an Aggie now. Yeah. I think you always say howdy, Rich. <laughs> All the way there on the other side. If you're, if you're listening, by the way, you can find video of this episode. Where can you find that? Just go to the website, microbe.tv. You can find a link to it there. But don't... Not while you're driving. All the way on the left side, Alan Dove. Well, I'm not quite all the way on the left side. There's somebody to my left, but I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and introduce now. It's good to be here. Good to be here in College Station, um, lovely area, and uh, the weather. For those who are longtime Twill listeners, you know we have to lead with this. Um, currently at uh, College Station Airport, which is right nearby, um, it's uh, nice, clear skies, visibility 10 miles. Temperature is 33 Celsius. And uh, even though the elevation is only about 400 feet, the density altitude is 2,700 feet. So the air density has been so affected by the heat that it's like being at a much higher altitude. Are you going to deny me the Fahrenheit reading? I don't have the Fahrenheit heat reading right here, but I can bring that up. Um, The weather I was looking at was only in Celsius. It is 90 Fahrenheit. Cool. 90? 90. That's bald. Positively yeah, chilly. It's not that bad. <laughs> all right. And finally, all the way on the left, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everyone. It's really fun to be here in College Station. This is for my first time here at Texas A&M. Anybody listen to TWIV here? I see oh. there's some that don't. You can go to microbe.tv. If you have a phone, you have a podcast player, just search for TWIV, listen. Who works on phages here? And you're not listening to TWIV, but you think TWIV is not a phage podcast? (laughs) Phage is a virus. This week in virology, you should listen. All right. Uh, You should stick around because these shirts here hanging on the front are going to be thrown out at the end. Not thrown out. We're going to toss them to you. (laughs) And if you're in the back, you're just not getting them because we don't have that good an arm. But if you want to come forward later, at the very end, you have to stick around to get a shirt. And if you don't get one, you could come tomorrow to uh, Austin. But I hear that would be a verboten thing to go to Austin, yes. right, <clears throat> and get a T-shirt. We have two local guests today sitting in the middle there at the table of honor. Uh, the closest to me, Rye Young. Welcome to TWIV. Good to be here. And your, your actual name is Ryland, right? Ryland, yes. Which is, I, I think is really a cool name. Ryland. Is it, what's, do you know the origin of yep, that? It comes from the county Rye. So. Really? Yep. Cool. Well, welcome. And next to Rye over there, Jason Gill. Welcome Hello. to 12. Hi. Uh, nice to be here. And you, you, you gentlemen are both members of the Center for Phage Technology here. We're going to talk a little bit about that and about you and your work. Sound good? Yep. Sounds good to me. Sounds like a good plan. And of course, we have a lovely audience here. Thank you for coming. And this is, as I said, being recorded as audio and video for your future listening pleasure. First question. And, you know, I have to tell you, I have a bunch of questions, and and you two publish a lot together. So if one of you thinks that the other is better to answer it, feel free to say, let him or let him do it, okay? First of all, why is there a Center for Phage Technology? Maybe, Rai, you were around when it was founded. Maybe you could field that one. Um, yeah, I can tell you the truth or I can tell you the story. Oh, <laughs> story for sure. <laughs> so, um, a mixture of the truth and the story. The, uh, it, it came about because I got a job offer somewhere else and one of my conditions 
for staying was I wanted to have a small investment to work on applications of phage. I had already had a long history of publishing in pure phage biology. and they. So you've been here for how long? 40 years. That's a long time. Yep. Uh, and when did the Center for Phage Technology happen? Started being born in... Um, 2008? No, actually, it started being born in 2006 when I was negotiating to whether I was going to stay or not. So that, okay, fine. Now, uh, you, so you've been here 40 years. Tell us a little bit of your backstory. Where, where are you from originally, Texas? I'm actually, uh, was born on the IU campus in uh, Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> but my father was a, a itinerant academic, and our family roots in, are in Texas. Yeah, ah. so I I, uh, I I can't I couldn't avoid being thrown out of several schools. So I started at Caltech, uh, went to Rice, um, went to MIT, got drafted, then came back, went to uh, UT Dallas for my PhD, and then went to Harvard as a postdoc, and came here to, as a faculty member in the medical school in '78 moved to the College of Agriculture and Department of Biochemistry in 86, so that's it. Can you remember when you wanted to do science, how far back in your life? Yes, I do. In fact, uh, my, uh, I think I was a, I know I've got my first bookmobile card. I was about eight years old and I never had, a, I never made a decision and beyond that in terms of professional. I don't remember making any decision except whether or not to go to Canada instead of being drafted. <laughs> <laughs> And when you went for a PhD, what area was that in? Like molecular biology. Molecular biology. Yeah. And at Harvard, you said that was a postdoc? I started at, at MIT, and that's when I got drafted. So okay. uh, after my draft appeal failed, then I went in the military. And when I came out, I uh, had, uh, I had a, a wife and kid. And so I, had to, I, went to a, I went to UT Dallas, which was more amenable to having a young family and being in graduate school. No, your postdoc was in Boston as in, well. In Harvard Medical. In what area? In phage biology, lambda phage biology. To, with whom? Mike Savannan. He, uh, he, I don't think it was my fault, but he, he moved on to uh, UC Irvine after that. Or UC Davis, excuse me, after that. So, uh, but I was the biggest influence on me there. I, we were adjacent to, to John Beckwith's lab, and so mm -hmm. I became kind of a Beckwith uh, satellite <laughs> <laughs> and have remained so for many years. And your, was your PhD also in phage? Yeah, it was PhD in molecular biology. I actually, my main work was on uh, ribosomal control in E. coli, but we use phage a lot. Yeah. And so I, I, after that, after I got my PhD, um, I've, everything I've done has been in phage biology. I guess you could say at one time molecular biology was phage, right? Yep. yep. That's it. It started the field. Yep. You wouldn't disagree, would you? I would not, no. And... Um, so we 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 kind of we kind of went away from the Center for Phage Technology. Yeah. I want to. Okay. So, so but we, they we agreed. Can, we can come back. We want to find out about oh, okay. his history. Yeah. It's okay. We'll get back to the center because I messed up. I started with the center instead of their history. Okay. It's okay. I do that sometime. Jason, tell us yes. your history. My history. So uh, I was born in Canada and I grew up in Toronto. Um, my parents actually. This is the alternate route for Rye. Yeah. They were draft dodgers actually, and that's why they're in Canada. Yeah. Um, I could have been your father. Then. Could have been. <laughs> <laughs> you could have. You could have gone to Toronto and hung out with all the other draft doctors, yeah. right? So, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So I grew up in uh, in Toronto, and uh, I started um, working on phage actually as uh, my, a master's project uh, after my undergraduate, and that was actually working for phages of a plant pathogenic bacteria. And uh, I was, uh, my mentor, there was a woman named Antonette Svirchev, and I was working in Agriculture Canada lab. That's where she was. It was kind of near the university. And she had this idea because she thought, you know, she'd heard about phages, and, you know, I bet you could use phages to control pathogenic bacteria. And she was really proud that she'd thought of this. But then going into literature, we found out that it actually wasn't such a, you know, but, that, but it was actually an old idea, but it kind of shows how dead the idea was that people who had, you know, full training in microbiology had never even heard of phage therapy, really. All right. So, um, I never read Aerosmith. Nope. Right. Yeah. Here you go. So um, it uh, so the the that project um, ended, and I went on to do a PhD at University of Guelph in Canada, and that was working on Staph aureus mastitis in dairy cattle, and was also looking at using phage to control that. Uh, and then after that, I came uh, here actually to work with Rye as a postdoc um, uh, to work on phage of Urkel area. They just got an NIH grant 
to work on that. And then the center was founded. I became the program director of the center. And then the part of the center was had faculty lines associated with it. And I was able to get one of those faculty lines. So when did you come here to work with Ray? Initially in 2006. Okay. Do you remember when you got interested in science? Um, I think from, from a young age, but I don't know, I don't have like kind of the classic, you know, I wasn't, I didn't decide to become a scientist when I was like eight years old or anything. Actually in high school, I was good at science and I was also good at English and actually was vacillating when going into undergraduate whether or not I should become an English major or go into sciences. Yeah. And uh, I decided I also would like to have a job when I got out. So uh, I decided to go into science. Sound thinking, yeah. Yeah, so I went into environmental sciences actually, which was a, um, it's a good, which was a good science program if you weren't sure what kind of science you wanted to get into because it was kind of an inter interdisciplinary program. So there was like a lot of chemistry involved as well. So uh, the, my undergraduate degree is actually environmental science. Um, but part of that degree was also a lot of like policy stuff. And it was like environmental policy classes and the policy part didn't, turn my crank as much uh, as doing the science. And so I switched over to a more research focused uh, uh, kind of track in my last year of undergraduate. As you can see, this is a off age twiv. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whoop. I guess nobody's excited about that. Nobody's excited about phages here. There's, there's no official phage sound you're supposed to make. So. Would they make it, would they make it twip? Could be. No, there's already a twip. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 There's a parasitology. I, I have often floated the idea of doing a phage podcast. But you could do that. twiff. 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 T-W-I-P-H. P-H. Yes. P-H, yeah. Could work. You think it's a good idea? Yeah. Or in, instead of P-H, a fee? That would, oh, well, God. Yeah. That, would confuse, that would confuse all the websites. Completely would, yeah. <laughs> It'd be hard to do on iTunes. Yes. I have to tell you, oh, your computer finally is working. Finally finished his, updating. He started his computer, started updating. So until now, he hasn't been able to see anything. And we could see if Rich could do an entire TWIV without any show notes. I, I bet you, you know, could. It's just a prop anyway. It's a prop. You know? yeah. Probably you could. I want to ask you, both of you, what's your favorite phage in the world? Jason. It's easy. One uh, only. One only phage. Uh, I guess right now it's probably um, phage K, which is the one we're working on a lot. And it's a Staph aureus phage. And it's a, it's a large myophage that infects Staph aureus virulent. It's kind of the, it's related to other large uh, phages of gram positives. And it's kind of the moral equivalent of T4 in gram positives. Did and you say the moral equivalent? That's what he said. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there may be a relationship there, but it's so, so distant. I think it's pretty hard to find, but it has the same, it has the same general kind of gestalt as, T, as T4 does, which is a large myophage, it's virulent. Every Ter phage has a gestalt. Yeah. It's very, it's very I'm learning a lot here. Yeah. Every so. phage has a gestalt. That, that's a great title for someday. You know, we can't use it for today. Every so phage has it's a gestalt. like saying you don't, you don't know how to define it, but you know when you see it, right? So it's, okay. it's kind of like that. How about you, Rye? You have a favorite? Lambda. Hmm. Lambda. All right. Classic. There's no, there's not even a second. Why lambda? Uh, I, I, it's the crown jewel of, um, it's certainly the crown jewel of, modern molecular biology. It may be the, our understanding of this organism is deeper than of any other. And it's the only organism where people actually try to do modeling ab initio and come close to having it work. So viruses are organisms? Lambda has, is an organism. I don't know if all the others rise to that. <laughs> Lambda speaks to me. Lambda has a soul. Okay. Yeah. So it seems to me that phage virologists work on many more different phages than maybe animal, an individual animal virologist would. Um, do you think that's true, and, and why do you think that's the case? Well, let me do the historical part, then he can do the relevant part. So when I was a graduate student, there were about 10 uh, major phage group types. Lambda, was, Lambda and T4 were the two biggest but there was P1 and P2, there were, there were lots of phages, and they all became very vertically developed. And uh, for example, when I was a graduate student, there were two Cold Spring Harbor meetings on phage, one for virulent phage and one for lysogenic phage, and the people didn't even talk to each other. So, um, there was, so there's an enormous knowledge base that's vertically developed for about 10 or 12 phages. And then, um, so that, and if you eventually do a, blast back to its roots for something we actually understand, it'll come back to one of those phages. Half the time it comes back to lambda or T4. 
But in the modern era, there's a good reason for having to study many other phages, which he can say. So um, for, <clears throat> uh, for actually using phages as, for, as applications, um, you know, we're like, we're, you're, have, you're driven by the pathogen you're interested in. So if you're interested in Salmonella or Staph aureus or Acinobacter, you have to get phages that are specific for those organisms, right? Because the phages are very specific. And it turns out, you know, once you start going away from kind of, you know, E. coli K12, and you start seeing some very different kinds of phages that we know very little about. Uh, so there's entire, you know, groups or families of phages that are there. And some of them, like the actual kind of the, the archetype of those phages was isolated a long time ago. But there may be a grand total of three or four papers on their actual biology. Um, they were just kind of used as tools. So a common thing was to use them just as, you know, if you wanted to make rough mutants of salmonella, you, there's a phage you could use that bound to the LPS and you get rough mutants and then that was a, that was kind of its purpose in the world was to make rough mutants for you. But it has a whole biology and evolutionary history of its own, which is often not well understood. And how does the microbiome fit into this diversity of what people study? Oh, uh, that's, I guess that's still an emerging area. Uh, where the, 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 the phageome is, you know, as kind of amorphous as the microbiome, what we know about the microbiome now, the phageome is even, the virome is more amorphous than that. Uh, because again, you have unculturable bacteria and you have a lot of unculturable viruses that infect all the different unculturable bacteria. And they're there and it's not that clear what all of them do. So there's one phage, it's called the crass phage. Uh, that's had a few papers on it and it's something you can find in a lot of microbiome virome samples. And it's thought that it infects uh, Bacteroides, but no one's ever, as far as I know, actually cultured that phage or done anything with it. You can just kind of see that the genome is there, but nobody really knows what it does. So nobody's isolated the virus particles, just the genome sequence? As far as I know. So the, the virus yeah. particles have been seen, and they've been able to, to monitor increase in the viral DNA under certain conditions, but there's still the classic time-honored, here's a phage, there's a plaque, that hasn't been done yet. And it doesn't help that it's a horrible uh, host that you have to do in an precise anaerobic. It's right. just hard. But it's in every, what, most people carry right. it. Whenever, you know, whenever they do microbiome, that's where it was kind of found. Because people do microbiome, like gut microbiome stuff. And then you just take the supernatant of that is the virome. Right. And there's something you can find. In some cases, it's very abundant uh, in the virome, like a, like a dominant uh, kind of DNA you see. But... Yeah, exactly what its role, like its ecological role in the microbiome, it's not not well understood. Rich, you want to get back to uh, the center? Yeah. So uh, you said that it was sort of conceived was, around 2006 or so. It was it was an inducement for me to stay. They may regret that now, but uh, so <laughs> uh, and at that time it was basically one postdoc uh, salary and some supplies. But then. Um, I went away on a sabbatical at Par in Paris at the Pasteur for a year, and during that period, we got a new uh, pro. This is this is good news for all of you guys who don't know about academics, the way things happen. We got a new provost who wanted to make his mark. He had, uh, and he decided to replicate something he had done as a dean at his previous place, and that was to go get a lot of money from whatever places, knocking over a 7-Eleven or going to the legislature, and then uh, announcing there would be a free for free for all. Um, competition for, and there were no limits of any kind other than it had to be interdisciplinary and the budgets could be unlimited and, you, and, and all they wanted to do, which they did, was to make phone rings all over campus. And uh, so as in, a, in the end, after a year of developing those, there are 100 and what, 120 of them, I think, something like that? Yeah. And they were everything from like smart seats to, you know, books that read themselves and floated above your head to uh, and many of them were very grandiose, uh, but there was one neat little package called the Center for Phage Technology where we, um, and we actually won that competition. So. And uh, what did that fund and where does the money come from? They, they gave us, uh, it was a joint, jointly sponsored by the Te Texas A&M University and then also the, college, the uh, uh, Texas, Agri it is now called Texas AgriLife. At the time it was called um, Taze, Texas Agricultural Experiment Station. But so it was jointly sponsored by that. They gave us an annual budget, uh, a substantial annual budget, at least in those dollars uh, 10 years ago. And they gave us, uh, most importantly, four faculty positions and the, and the uh, support to, uh, to uh, set them up. And so it, this, it's been a multi, multi million dollar uh, investment in, in the last nice. 10 years. And so how many faculty are now in the center? Four, uh, uh, four junior faculty. We also have 
senior older faculty, some of whom are actually here. Uh, but we've, the, the makeup of the center has changed to a certain extent because we've had several senior faculty leave and a new senior faculty join up. And so, uh, but the, uh, I think we have, I, I would think we would, uh, we would agree to having three active senior labs and four, um, four of the assistant professors that were What's hired. the, so the unifying theme of this, all the labs obviously work on phage, right. but you called it the Center for Phage Technology. I assume yep. that there's an emphasis on translational projects of some kind. Explicitly in the, uh, in the mandate, we, we, we are an official Board of Regents Center. So there's a lot of centers on campus, but not very many have actually gone through the rigmarole required for uh, the def definitive, and, and in our mandate statement, uh, it is to promote biology, but also to promote its translational applications. So. I wanted to talk a bit about phage therapy. Both of you have published in this area, and um, maybe you could just start with telling us what, I, I know you've published a paper on a very uh, well-publicized case of an S. natobacter infection. We'll get, I, I'd like you to describe that, but first, what's, what's your overall goal in this program? I, I'm going to let Jason speak to this because right. he's got a much longer future than I have. So. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I mean, the goal of the center is really is to do uh, kind of translational phage work, right? So um, part of that is to do the basic science, which will um, kind of underpin the translation so that this is not like just like a purely empirical exercise. Uh, but then also at the same time, it's trying to do applications. So I'm actually in the Department of Animal Science here. Uh, so um, a number of the projects in my lab have to do with uh, animal health uh, and food safety, right? So that's the, some of the pathogens we're looking at. But there's a lot of crossover there, right? Because a lot of animal pathogens and, and foodborne pathogens are also human pathogens. So you have a segue uh, into that. And so the, uh, the idea is really just try to find the right applications um, that where phage can be useful. There actually, there are uh, several phage products on the market already for food safety applications. Like Listeria, are, I think, right? Hmm? Isn't Listeria one of them? Yeah, there's one for Listeria and what there's else? one for Salmonella uh -huh. and there's one for 015787. 7 uh, in cattle. And so these are FDA approved. I mean, they're approved as... Food supplements, too. Oh, yeah, actually, that's right. And there's also a nutritional supplement company that sells a pill with phage in it uh, as well, a... What is that for? Uh, well... What else you have? It's a <laughs> nutritional supplement. It's for your well-being. Yeah. So it's very, you know, they, the, the lawyers... This product started. does not diagnose or treat any, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Exactly. So it's very cagely worded on their on the package about what it does, but the phage are in there. I think it's in there with a probiotic of some kind. Is it one phage in there or multiple? Um, it's four phages. Uh, in four there. different phages. Yeah, um, two of which we isolated here actually, and one was isolated by the company, and then one is just T4. Good old good old <laughs> T4. It's in there. And I'm, I'm sorry to dwell on this, but these are infectious in the pills or not infectious phages? They are. Yeah, yeah you can bust a pill open and get PFU out of it. Huh. Yeah. So. They were supposed to send us a bottle, and they never have, actually. So, uh, I pop one every morning. You do? <laughs> just in case. Are, are they all E. coli phages? Yes, in that case. Yeah, for that, for that it's all E. coli. So I just go into my fridge every morning and just take, take a swig of the T4 bottle that's in there. So the, the uh, salmonella application, what's, the, what's um, that's that? That's for food safety. This is a company that has that. What's it applied to? Um, right now, they're actually, they're looking for the right application for it. So it's been, it's been approved. So the thing with the product, you can have it, and it might, you know, it's might, it's approved for use. Okay. But they're trying to figure out where the most efficacious place to put it in. Say, if you want to use it for poultry, I mean, do you put it in the water? Do you spray it on the birds and they're alive? Do you do it during processing? So food you, safety is not regulated the same way as a drug, where you'd need an indication and a treatment. No, it's, right. it is a, it is approved for safety. It's, it's a really, food the main part thing. of the FDA. Yeah. yeah. I learned on a recent swim that chickens are sprayed with dilute chlorine before slaughter. Is yeah. that right? Um, so yeah, could, I think that sounds like that's something that would be done in so some operations. You could instead spray them with dilute phage, right? You could. And the thing is, does it, what, does it work or not? And that's, yeah. that's the thing. And so a lot of it's still relatively empirical, particularly a lot of the things where you want to use phages are on, actually the bacteria you want to go after are on surfaces. And that's true on, for foods, and that's also true, like, say, in the gut. Or you have biofilms, like, you know, for Acinobacter or Staph aureus. And most of what we know about how phages work is in, you know, shaker flasks in a, in a shaker and how phage interact with their hosts on surfaces when they're in very different physiological states and they would be, you know, in their, they would, then they would be in LB at 37 degrees. A lot of that is not well understood. Now, you alluded to this earlier, but um, phage, phage therapy is not a new idea. 
the idea of no. killing bacteria with phage. This goes back it's about a, over, over 100, about 100 years. years. Yeah. Um, so it was discovered that this could happen, and there was initial excitement that, hey, you can control bacteria with phage, and then it turned out that that didn't pan out. Why is it different now? Well, first of all, um, I don't know what pan out means. So, so, okay, so yes, th right. This was done in the early part of the 20th century before our current standards for panning out were yes. established. <laughs> and they're, they're, uh, the, I think it, it made you, the main reason it failed, there are lots of reasons something like this can fail. It depends on what you call by fail. But there were hundreds of thousands of people who were treated with phage uh, in the, in the pre 1930s era in, in the United States, not just in, in the, and probably over mil in millions in, in India. So, um, but the, the, we just didn't have good ways of, of, of assessing, um, effect. And, and since they knew nothing about DNA or molecular biology right. or anything, or it, was, it was essentially impossible. Were, there was no basic there, science. Yeah. And there was a, in, there was an AMA commissioned a major report in 1934 which is largely is the uh, Eaton Bain Jones report, and it is cited as the death knell of phage therapy. But in fact, what it says is that there's no demonstrated benefit. All right, and so the problem is they didn't have good ways of doing that. And in fact, if you read the report, which I have done in, in detail, there uh, there is uh, a lot of evidence, and even they admit it at the end uh, that the phage therapy against Staph aureus infections was in fact effective just by, you could show statistically that was. And Jason knows why, because his phage is, uh, well, the phage he studies is, uh, is basically the perfect phage pill for, for staff. So this was a study done by you or coordinated no, or by it was others? Done in 1934. Oh, obviously not, <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. You know, I'm not that old, I mean. <laughs> so have you done, have you, I know there's this published uh, example, but ha have you done any clinical trials or do you plan to do any clinical trials in the near future in humans? Um, there are companies that are doing clinical trials okay. right now. There's a few phage therapy companies around uh, and they're all, not all, but there are a couple of, a few different phase two clinical trials right. that are they're trying to get off the ground. Um, there have been major failures. Yeah, well, there's major been one. The, most ex the largest phage therapy trial was in Europe. Uh, it was called Fagoburn. It was a multinational, multi-company involved, and it was a complete failure. I, I, mean, I mean, I don't want to insult my European colleagues, but they, they reported that there was no, out, no outcome. And when was that? The report came out this year. So uh, I think it was in January this year. And what, what kind of infection was it to treat? Oh, that was the problem. Well, burns. It was ma mainly burns. Burns. What they were so these were topical treatments, right? Uh, I think it was mostly topical. I think it was mostly topical. I'm not as familiar with the methodology as I... Uh, but it was like a... But burns are typically uh, polymicrobial. Right. Uh, which is... It's, it's a, it makes it a very difficult target to begin with. And the phage they use was a single phage to no, treat this? No, no. Multiple. Mixture of, mixture. mixture of phages. Now, well, a problem with developing these for more specific conditions, and I, and I believe one of the rationales for using this in burns, is that there are effective treatments available for a lot of bacterial infections already. And if you're setting up a clinical trial, you would have to provide at least the standard of care. Mm -hmm. So if you're treating somebody with antibiotics and also treating them with phage, how are you going to detect what's yeah. happening? So I, I assume that this would be a trial you would structure in people who have failed initial therapy. They have a drug resistant, a MRSA or what have you. But that's not the Fago burn thing. They had comparative. Right. They, that, was, that was, no, but I'm saying in future, maybe an approach to this would be yeah, to look at drug resistance. Yeah, to do a standard of care. Right. And um, one of the things I've gathered just from going to different meetings and stuff is that the um, the future of a lot of different antimicrobials they're going to be more narrow spectrum than they have been in the past, which makes the clinical trial as you under, as we understand it much more difficult to recruit for, because you're looking for it's not just you have to have a bacterial infection you have to have a bacterial infection with this particular bug, and typically for clinical trials. You have to have that problem and no other problems, right? And you have to be of a certain age and weight and everything else. And so actually recruiting to kind of these idealized patients for these trials is very difficult. So, you know, it's going to be very difficult if you want to try to get for a phase two trial a few hundred patients in. It can take a long time uh, to do that recruitment. Um, so, so backing up a little bit, how do things look preclinically? What have you got so far? Um, so, so far, I mean, there's, the, the work in the literature that's been done in animal studies is generally positive. Um, there's at least 40 papers that show phages will work in a number of, in all kinds of different bacterial infections in various kinds of mouse and small animal models. 
Uh, actually, one of my papers is probably one of the only negative results <laughs> uh, published for phage therapy because we did a clinical trial in uh, dairy cattle for Staph aureus. And that was a placebo-controlled trial, but these were naturally occurring infections as well. So these, they, they, these, establish, these infections may have been established for months or years before we got to them. But in that case, we didn't see uh, an effect in that trial. How was the phage administered? Uh, and that, for mastitis, this is for mastitis and dairy cattle, so that's normally done with an intramammary infusion, and that's how antibiotics are normally administered for cattle as well. So you have like a cannulated syringe that you just stick into the teat canal, and it's usually about a five or 10 mil dose. Uh, and that's done because you're, you're delivering the drug to the site, and just because the, you know, the dairy cow is very big. So if you did it intravenously or intramuscularly, you'd have to have this, you know, Huge you'd have dose. to pump in this enormous amount of antibiotic because of the- You have to be gentle. The dilution, <laughs> yeah. And also you get kicked in the head sometimes, <laughs> yeah. So, and do you um, have to tailor the phage to the cow in this case? Uh, in that case, we had a standard treatment. We used actually phage K, you know, based on our preliminary stuff. That seemed to be, that was the most virulent phage we had. Um, but we, we know that it wasn't because the phage were resistant, because we got part of the recruitment for that was to get, we isolated the bacteria out of the cattle before the trial. They're all sensitive to the phage. And then after the treatment, we isolate the bacteria again, and they're still sensitive to the phage. So there are issues with the penetration of the phage and the distribution of the phage to the site, uh, and the, the stability of the persis persistence of the phage in the site. And again, that kind of stuff is not well understood as well, like how, um, because, you know, phages, unlike, say, a lot of small molecule antibiotics, which can penetrate tissue and they can be lipophilic, you know, phages are large hydrophilic things, right? So they're not going to diffuse through tissue as easily. Uh, but there is some evidence they can penetrate tissue barriers. But again, that's all, um, you know, that's all not really well understood right now. These are probably also going to be hard to deliver orally, right? Um, actually, a lot of stuff is done orally. Okay. So, um, if it's a GI infection, then okay. you can do oral. It survives the stomach and gets uh, yeah. You know, Enough milk, get milk of magnesium, and then you just uh, yeah. Okay. So some people, some places, they'll just you know you, you do a shot of bicarb, right? Or you can just put the phages in a pretty strong buffer, and it'll get a lot of them through the stomach. Uh, and you and, only need to get a few because they're going to replicate. Yeah, but again, that's also not clear, right? So if you have a, so if you say you have a, an infection and you dose with. I don't know, 10 to the 10 phages, right? How many of those 10 to the 10 phages actually participate in the treatment and how many are just lost? Because they're, they're going to replicate once they go in there. So it's really hard to tell uh, like how many phages are actually, are actually participating in, in your treatment. We did a paper not too long ago on TWIV, and you probably know this, where they showed that phages are transcytosed yeah. across eukaryotic cell layers. Thoughts about that? Is that? Does that help you at all? Well, it doesn't surprise me, phage... I've learned to do that. They've been around a long time, and um, so uh, the the uh, our most dramatic successes so far, um, other than the highly publicized and anecdotal uh, study with uh, Dr. Dr. Patterson, has been with uh, uh, Carlos Gonzalez's groups uh, has generated really effective phase treatments of of a plant disease, a very important one called Pierce's disease, which is threatening the uh, the California viniculture. And uh, there, uh, his team can, has found phages you can inject directly into the, into the, um, into the vine, in the cordons of the grapevine and provide either 100% curing or 100% uh, prophylaxis of, of this disease, which left uh, untreated is it wipes out. Uh, well, the other treatment, of course, is to, is to douse your entire million dollar California grapevine uh, area with a terrible insecticides, which are banned in Europe, but are still permitted in Northern California. So, uh, so that's, that's, that's uh, our original plan. In fact, we, if you read in our original proposal that we went to war with back in 2007 was that we would, we would, uh, our, our primary routes for applications would be in, in agriculture, uh, animal husbandry and, uh, and in plants because of the lower, um, lower regulatory hurdles and the, and uh, we thought that, uh, I remember having explicit discussions with Jason and with uh, Carlos about how eventually if we, if we feed, if we save Mrs. Jones' cat, she's going to know, well, why can't it save my daughter, right? So uh, that was our plan. So th this, this current wave of, of enthusiasm about the human phage therapy is maybe a little overdone since I don't think we've really learned very much. You know, it's just a publicity, it's, so far it's been a publicity effect. 
Now, you mentioned lower regulatory barriers, but you're talking about the, the vineyards in California, and California is known for having some rather, um, yeah. shall I say, complex ideas about molecular biology. Yeah, yeah. The, the EPA in California, as we've discovered, is they're like the, uh, the Hezbollah of regulatory agents, right? So <laughs> they, are, they are truly something. So we've kind of uh, touched around what I thought Vincent was getting to, which was this uh, study about the acinetobacter um, therapy, and maybe one of you could describe it. And then I have a couple questions about it. Um, maybe I'll interject them as we go along. But maybe just describe it for the listening audience that doesn't really know about Jason it. Jason needs to do this. I need to. All right. So um, we actually, Rye was contacted initially in, uh, I guess, about February of, of uh, 2016. Uh, by Stephanie Strasty uh, who's at UC San Diego, and her husband had been in a coma for uh, several weeks uh, already in the UCSD Medical Center with a, a disseminated Acinobacter baumannii infection that he'd picked up while overseas in, in Egypt. Uh, so the strain was basically pan-resistant to antibiotics, and he was declining. And so this was kind of a last resort, so really kind of in desperation, they were looking for alternate treatments. So this is a systemic infection, yeah. right? So it started out, I think, as like a pancreatitis, um, but by the time we were contacted, he had multiple abscesses, and they were culturing Acinobacter from his sputum, um, from multiple drains. It was showing up in his blood sporadically as well. He'd had multiple episodes of sepsis. Uh, like I said, he'd been in a coma for quite a while. Um, and so this was kind of a last ditch attempt. And so um, Stephanie so contacted Rye, and they, they had talked, and then the first thing I heard about it, remember we were, it were teaching the, uh, our phage classes lab. It was the lab day on Friday. And Rai told me that, you know, he'd been in contact with this person and he thinks that we should try to go ahead um, to try to help them out. And so I think that night we talked to them on the phone and we got things spinning up, I guess, pretty much that weekend. So we had to wait for the strain to arrive, right? So the thing is we had to get, we had to get Tom Patterson's strain. First, we had to get approval to bring a pan-resistant Acinetobacter baumannii strain into a building that was just crawling with undergraduates. So, uh, <laughs> and we had to get approval from the Texas a and lawyers and from the IBC, from the IRB, and so on. Uh, but they were all remarkably, uh, when they heard the life was at stake, they, uh, between them and their parallel interactions with the UCSD people, it, it was amazing. It was like the Red Sea parted. <laughs> for, How did the patient's wife know to... Where'd she get the idea to get in touch with Google you guys? search, as far as I know? It's pretty Google, so she found Rye. Rye she found Center for Phage. Yeah. We show up if you do a Google search on Phage Technology. Yeah, if you look for Phage Therapy and Phage Therapy. I think, I think she found initially. But she knew to look for Phage Therapy. Well, she, yeah. she had, she's the Associate Dean of Global Health, public, global, global Public Health at UCSD. She's educated. Okay. Okay. And so she knew about Phage. Right. But I think it was you know, PubMed searches that she was just looking for alternate uh -huh. treatments. She found that and then started looking for uh, Phages. Um, and uh, so the lesson here is Mary well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she's a, r a real champion. And uh, so once we got the strain, uh, then things sw uh, swung into action. We only had a few phages of, against Acinobacter baumannii on hand. We hadn't really had a, 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 a major kind of a baumannii like phage hunting project had been running. So we only had a few phages, and actually it was Adriana who's here, uh, did this initial testing, and uh, uh, Lauren is also here was involved and um, uh, so it turned out that the, the, the few phages we had didn't infect that strain. So um, luckily because we never clean out our fridge and never throw anything away, we had a lot of environmental samples from previous phage hunts uh, over the years. And so we had about 100 of those samples, or 125 samples. So we, I should uh, break in, in the, we, have a, we have a long standing phage course, a major part of which is a big old fashioned phage hunt every year and we change the bacterial target every couple of years. And so Baumannia had happened to be one of those. And so, uh, anyway. so you literally started digging in the dirt. Yeah. In the, well, yeah, and dirt. So, yeah. So it was like animal soup. Sewage is a good place to go for a lot of phage, uh, phage isolates, soil, right. depending, uh, animal waste, um, uh, animal environments are good. Dep kind of depends on the phage. And, the and then you just started applying these filtrates to the strain that you'd gotten yeah. from UCSD. Yeah, more or less. So we, yeah, we, we typically do what's called like an enrichment. So you'll take that sample and you have like a liquid extract of the sample, or if it's already liquid, you just use that. And you can spike it with the bacteria, and you hopefully, if there's any phage in there that are in there, they'll replicate uh, on the host that you gave it. And so we gave it the Patterson strain, uh, and then we ended up with four phage isolates from that. 
And then also, uh, we put the call out to other companies and labs that we knew. Uh, Rye has a pretty good social network of that, and we got stuff from a uh, group in Europe. Um, we got, I think it was from the Fagelburn people in we, Europe. We, every, we single person, every single company, institute, or personal researcher that, that I contacted who had a Bamani iPhage sent it without any paperwork or question. Uh, including companies that with, whose IP, the, the, right. the whole survival depends on them. They just went ahead and did it. Yeah. Because, I, uh, because I, their life was at stake. Yeah. Here, right? I, I cheated and had a glance at the paper. And if I'm not mistaken from the table, the, the origin of a couple of these is the Navy? Yeah. Is that, Navy. How does the Navy, what's the Navy doing looking for phage? <laughs> Well, that's your tax dollars at work, right? So, <laughs> that's great. fine with me. So, yeah, so um, pretty much uh, just about the same time they contacted us, and they contacted the Army and the Navy. So they have had kind of long-standing projects on Baumannii for at least several years now. A decade. More than uh, a, decade. a decade. Since, since the original uh, Iraq War, because we had so many uh, wounded uh, uh, soldiers and Marines. Major medical problem. It was a that. major medical okay. problem. Yeah. Uh, and so they'd had these, these projects going. And so, so um, the condensed version is that so we didn't have a fade, so we had to go find one, right? And we ended up finding four isolates, which turned out actually to be the same phage, and one phage from a company called Amplify that also would hit that strain, and we used that. Uh, and then the Navy, uh, they already had a really pretty extensive collection of phages already. And so they just took the strain and screened it against all the phages they already had, uh, and they found four phages as well. Uh, and they, they prepared their phages, we prepared our phages, and they all got sent out uh, to San Diego. Um, ours were, were prepared in collaboration with the, the rover lab. Uh, Jeremy, actually, Jeremy, you know the guy who did the, the transcytosing phage? The Jeremy Barr, he was actually the, a postdoc in Forest Rover's lab at the time, and he did the phage cleanup. So luckily, he was actually just finishing up a manuscript on like a new method for cleaning up the endotoxin out of phage preparations. And so we tried it in our lab, and it, it, it was very time consuming, and we were trying to grow up the phage at the same time, and so we kind of sub, subbed that out to them, so we'd, we'd concentrate the phage, send it to the rower lab, and Jeremy Barr would then do the cleanup and the endotoxin removal, do the testing, and then I think Anka Siegel would then take it in her car over to the uh, UCSD Medical Center, uh, and where it would then be diluted and, and buffer and then administered. This was given uh, intravenously, right? Um, so ours, our, so there was a two kind of the two preparations, ours and the Navy's that ended up with. So ours were administered uh, intracavitarily, and the Navy's were administered intravenously. Uh, so that he was kind of getting the two phages from two kind of from both sides. So what was the total turnaround time from phone call to patient receiving phage? Phone call. When were you contacted by phone? Yeah, I think we right? figured out it was uh, so we, fifteen days. So I we think, know. Kind of, wow. Yeah. So from receiving the strain. Uh, in our hands to the having the phage administered to him was 15 days. I don't think days matters. It's number of hours. Right. The day, the day uh, interventions may, mean nothing. The, the team that worked was just there permanently. Right. I'm just curious about how you had to prepare this to give to the patient because like, the FDA wasn't involved, right? Oh, they were. They were. They were? This, this was done under an EIND okay. uh, with the FDA, and they're also very helpful uh, with this. And so there's enough literature uh, enough history with this uh, to show that the phages are not, they weren't worried about toxicity of the phage itself, right? Because phages are in your microbiome, we're all covered in phages, the water's full of phage. There's actually been a number of phase one trials of feeding and injecting phage, and it's all been fine. And so really the main thing they're worried about was the endotoxin levels, because we knew this would have to be given some kind of, some kind of parenteral administration would be required. So, but, this, but, but the important thing to note is this is for an EIND for a a patient that's not even expected to survive. I think the the criteria will be much, and we yes. hope they'll be much stricter yes, for it's just it's general. It's quite episode. different from a from an actual clinical trial. Yeah. Right. So one of my questions is going to be if um, this was all done, you know, sort of out of the goodness of your heart. There were probably no costs really involved to the recipient or the recipient's insurance company, even if they would have covered it. What's the billing code have, for this? But, right. Yeah. But. Um, uh, and so, obviously, this thing to be not just for people who are on death's door to get it has to go through a lot of trials. But I wonder if you could give a ballpark estimate, you know, of what this might cost and what kind of technological things you would want to do to streamline it and make it faster and or cheaper. This is where I would turn to 
uh, Dr. May Lu, who's our director, because I would give some number and she'd say, no, no, 10 times that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I mean, it's, it's mainly time, right? I mean, so how do you quantify how much? Uh, well, and the problem person, is person hours in some ways, right. but you but know, the, I'm thinking the, of like individual new resistant bacteria shows up and you have all the, you know, trials in place, but then, you know, how much would it cost for that patient? Perhaps. To identify the phage, and and in our, we, we believe that we would have to not only identify, but characterize them in depth to make sure they're not, for example, lysogenic phages. We would like to make sure the phages have different receptors so you don't have rapid uh, evolution of resistance. So those will all, that, all of that is going to add to the cost. I, I think the idea that we're working towards, and Jason is better equipped to talk about this, is to have a pre, well-defined pre uh, assembled library of phages that we know hopefully for each major pathogen would, would attack a particular different receptor and have that all ready to go. So where all we had to do was to find them like the Navy did in their much better organized system and then grow them up and quickly purify them and send them off to the... Uh, so that's the concept here, rather than providing um, providing general purpose therapy, you, you would approach this as a personalized medicine right. type of project where on a patient-by-patient -patient basis, the laboratory actually picks the particular phage that's going to be deployed for that individual and, and personalizes it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when, you, when the patient was given the phage, what happened? Um, so there was uh, uh, a recovery. So there, there was actually there was, a, there was a, a, a brief episode of sepsis that happened, and then they actually was, then they withheld the phage uh, from because they thought it was because of the phage, but it turned out it was actually unrelated. Uh, I think one of his many drains or shunts had slipped uh, and was leaking into his uh, circulation. He had uh, a fungal infection too, I think. Yeah, oh, he had candidiasis. He had candidiasis. So. They, they were culturing bacteroides at one point. Yeah, he had, he had a lot of problems. So, um, but then within a, f a few days after treatment started, uh, he regained consciousness. Uh, and then he really just continued to recover uh, after that. He became more and more lucid. He was on, I think, two different pressors at the time. Uh, of when they started with the phage because it was to keep his blood pressure up, and they were able then to withdraw the pressors, and his culture just became kind of lighter, and the drain started to clear up, and then um, I don't think the exact time, I think it was by about a month or six weeks afterwards, he, um, the, the culturing became less and less, and then eventually became culture negative. So he was discharged from the hospital in August of 2016, uh, and then he, was, he recovered at home after that, because he like he lost like a hundred pounds, you know, because he'd been in, in the hospital for so long, and he was not a small guy; he was a big guy actually. He's like over six feet tall. If he lost a hundred pounds, he had to have started with yeah a lot some, more some mass. How yeah. many okay. how many doses the phage did he get? Oh, a lot, a lot. So he was given every four every two or four hours eventually um, for several weeks. So after even after the first batch got sent, then. Uh, we had to immediately just start making another batch. And so we made a, a lot of batches of phage that got sent out because uh, each batch, I guess, was enough for about, about a week or 10 days, maybe, of treatment, and then they would use it up. And so then we, would, we, had, we had, ended up making multiple batches. Well, if you need antibodies to this phage, you know where to go. Yeah. <laughs> well, so that's one of the things that I think about when I think about phage therapy is the patient mounting an immune response to the therapy. Mm -hmm. Is this something you think about? Yeah. And so what, what are your thoughts about that? Um, there could be an issue uh, for all these kinds of acute things. It didn't seem to interfere in this one case. There was a, there was a little bit of work done. They looked at like the kind of the half life of the phage in his circulation um, after administration. And the, when they first started, you know, there was uh, as the phage was still detectable. I think at six hours in the bloodstream. Whereas after he'd been given the phage for a few weeks, they weren't able to detect the phage uh, anymore after administration. But it's hard to say if that's because. He is developing antibodies, or just his immune system in general was working better because he wasn't completely bacteremic anymore. Uh, so it's hard to say. But now we can bring lambda back into the, into the conversation, <laughs> which is a much more pleasant uh, subject. So there's a famous experiment done at, at uh, NCI and NIH. Well, how many years ago was it? The Argonaut is it was 96. 96. 96. So 20, 20 years ago, it was a. Uh, they, basically, the idea was to see how long phage would last in the in the mouse circulatory system. So they injected lambda into the into um, a mouse into mice, and 
and it turns out they get cleared in 24 hours, uh, most by the RE system in one way or another. And uh, but but they were lambda geneticists, and so they were highly intelligent, and so they uh, they, they, <laughs> they just waited for a while and then selected a few a few remaining phages right. that were still there, and then passaged it through another mouse, and then after three passages. Phages then re stayed without and didn't decay at all for a week. And the well, in the it was uh, much the half life was much longer. Yeah, and, and it turns out then they then they went and did lambda genetics on this and discovered this was a single base pair, it's a single a codon change of a, a I think it was a glutamate to lysine or lysine to glutamate in in a, in the coat in the major coat protein. And that's all that's required. That tells me that if a phage wants to stay in a bloodstream, it will. Right, and lambda lambda is just showing off, but I mean, uh, uh, enteric bacteria are probably one 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 codon away from doing whatever they want to in the bloodstream. Now, how they get in the bloodstream is another issue. So, but but going back to Rich's point, I'm amazed this this man received weeks of therapy that if two weeks he should have antibodies that would clear it, right? Um, yeah, he might have. I mean, so the, and so this, there is actually a freezer with a bunch of serum in it still, which, you know, if we wanted to go back and, and do those studies, so I think we probably okay. could. You haven't done that, right? But we haven't been able to do that. So, um, uh, but another, another issue is the, just the bacteria becoming resistant to the phage, which actually happened by, I think, about 12 days after, is it longer than 12 days? Is it earlier than 12 days? So about, let's say about a week after phage were administered, then the, the bacteria coming out were, were starting to get resistant to the phage. And um, by, I think by three weeks in, they were resistant to, to all the phages. So, but at that point, he was recovering. So the decision was made to just to keep administering the phages, right? Because it might have been that the, the phage-resistant mutants maybe were less virulent, and so you'd want to keep that pressure up to, to maybe, you know, that, you, don't, you don't want to withdraw them. Right. And it's basically, it seemed to be working. They so, weren't doing any harm, clearly. Yeah. And, and so and the, so and the and decision the, was to keep and to be, And the Navy actually was able to take the resistant strain and uh, isolate and find one, another one of their phages that worked on it. So that was thrown into the pot, mm -hmm. and it may have been important, too. But also, I don't think we know, I'm not an immunologist, uh, far from it, but I'm not sure myself that that after the, the very high bacterial load was reduced, that the, his own immune system had a lot to do with right. The, right. Right. his real recovery. Because right. I think ph phages aren't very good at exterminating bacteria. Once you, when you have a phage and there's a lot of bacteria, a phage can go to town. But if you take lambda phage and E. coli and you put them 10 to the fifth per mil in a, in a, in a uh, culture flask, they never contact each other. So they, and people always ask me, why are there any bacteria left in the ocean? Well, because the titers are kept to where they don't yeah, collide yeah. very often. So. so how's this guy doing now? Oh, he's fine. So there's a, um, I think he's back at work. There's a, uh, there's a TED talk that Stephanie gave uh, on this, this issue. Uh, it's been covered in a, uh, the popular press. I think it was like a yeah, Time magazine. A book coming out and a movie deal. Wow. Yeah, so <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll wait to see about the movie deal, but there is a book coming out. So, Rai, I sense that you're uncomfortable or unhappy about this situation. Why is that? Because uh, I'm getting inundated uh, with uh, uh, emails and phone calls of people who want phage therapy right now. And my, uh, my argument is I don't believe the, the science has been done yet. So uh, I'd, like to see, um, I'd like to see more basic science, more, more of course, it's self-serving. I'd like to see more NIH funding of basic phage biology. So, uh, so who's playing you in the movie? Robert Duvall. Robert Duvall. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> that would be, yes. Yes. I've, I've talked to him about it. So it, 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 uh. How, uh, speaking of uh, support for phage work, in the scheme of virology, how much phage gets done? Is it a vanishingly small fraction? So in 2002, I did a study uh, in, uh, using the CRISP database of NIH, and I uh, got all, the, all of the grants that had the word phage in the abstract or the title, and then looked at them to make sure they were actually phage biology grants, and including everything from studying DNA polymerase by uh, famous people who are chairman of the National Academy, Bruce Alberts, or uh, real you know people doing lambda genetics. Um, and there, in 2002, there were 10 grants total. In, uh, 2000, in 1972, there were 300. So in that period, um, of 30 years where the number of NIH grants went up several fold, at least the number of phage, the specific activity of phage biology went down by, by, uh, you know, almost an order of magnitude or more than an order of magnitude. So 
it, it, it nearly died out uh, as a basic science uh, phenomenon. There have been a few young people hired. We hired about half of the, of the uh, assistant professors hired for explicitly for phage biology, I think, in the country in our, during our little um, exercise. So. So, so besides here, the Center for Phage Technology, are there other similar well, collections? The, the oldest uh, uh, collection is actually in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh Bacteriophage Institute predated uh, us by quite a bit. And uh, the late Roger Hendricks, who I believe is one of the greatest phage biologists uh, ever, who passed away this year, tragically, um, was the you know a, a, a major player there, along with Graham Hatfield, Jeff Lawrence. They have a, I, I took my inspiration from the, from them actually. So I did. I interviewed Hendricks many years ago on TWIM, and he talked about this little pond sitting on a rock that he was studying for like ten years. Mm -hmm. The populations yeah. of bacteria and phages. Yeah. He was so excited about it. I know. Roger was. <laughs> it was great character. So if we don't have any more on phage therapy, I would like to talk about some other things. Is that okay? So one thing I wanted to ask... You're, you're going to digress? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Which we don't usually do, I know. We'll, we'll allow it this I, one time. I hope I don't shock you. I wanted to ask you, Jason or Rye, there's this cool paper, and I spoke to the faculty member who works on this. Is she here? No. She's a environmental engineer. What's her name? Yeah, she's not here. Bella. About using phage to extract lipids to make biodiesel. Mm -hmm. I think we need, you need to just tell us about that. Our listeners need to hear this story. Can you, can you describe it? Yeah, so uh, that's a project that started, which I guess I was like the program director of the CPT at the time. And then one of the things that the CPT is supposed to be doing is supposed to be a, a a resource for people on the campus, right? So she had an idea for using phage, but you have people that kind of hear about phage, but they don't really know what to do. So mm -hmm. they can come to us and really we, you know, I, she sent some students over and I helped them get um, some methods together for, you know, doing some analysis and isolating phage. And so the, they, the idea was that you could have uh, their bacteria that will accumulate um, triacylglycerols to pretty high levels. Uh, I think up to, some of these strains will get up to like 70% of their dry weight in these triacylglycerol. Rhodococcus. Yeah, Rhodococcus opacus is one of them, and it'll just, it'll just accumulate triacylglycerol, and you can use that as a stock for biodiesel. So, so can you describe that in a little more detail, how tri triacylglycerols are important to get to biodiesel? What, what has to happen? Okay, so you can extract the triacylglycerol, and then there's a chemical process, which I think is like an alkaline process, which will then uh, saponify them into fatty acids, which is basically biodiesel. Right, so, um, I think, so I think you end up with we end up, you end up with biodiesel and this kind of crude glycerol and ends up from that, from that process. And so the idea is that you could use maybe phage then to release the, these triacylglycerol droplets from inside the bacteria and be cheaply. released into the media cheaply. Yeah, that's yes. the big, you know, once you start talking non-human phage therapy, you're talking about how much does it cost and how, how easy is it to do. So. Yeah. And because apparently the extraction is costly, right? Yeah. Well, the, well, the extraction, I think, is uh, solvent-based is the main thing right now. Um, and the scales at which these things need to be done to make any impact on diesel. I mean, this is the fuel that runs the economy. You're yeah. talking shiploads, literally. Yeah. yeah, so you need, but the idea is you'd use like um, really basically free, you know, waste right. streams as the feedstock, but you'd have to do it in large volume. But then you have to process that feedstock. And so yeah. this, would, this would cut down one of the most costly aspects of yeah. that. That's the idea. All right. So you'd have a cleaner extraction. Um, but like, like a lot of these alternate technologies, they only make sense when oil is like a certain dollar right. per barrel, which we're probably not at right. now anymore, but uh, maybe in the future. Yeah, once we enter the Mad Max future, then this has become <laughs> uh, much more uh, uh, viable. Uh, and so uh, we isolated phages against uh, rotococcus and um, doing, we've, we've, one thing we've discovered is that doing molecular biology in rotococcus is, is quite painful. Uh, you know, the shuttle vectors are, don't work that great, and so just trying to get anything to work in there. But we, did get, we got some neat phage biology Really done. cool phages, you have to yeah, say. Done. So some really, yeah. uh, for us, a good side effect was we got some really good phage biology done because one of the phages we isolated was a, a tectivirus, right, which is like a, a kind of, it's not a phage, we, not a kind of phage we normally work with. We, we're typically, when we're doing phage isolations, we're most of the time dealing with cotoviralis phages, the double-strand DNA tailed phages. And tectivirus is this other family of uh, lipid-enveloped uh, double-strand DNA phages that have a protein covalently attached to each end. 
uh, and they're like a different lineage of phage than the cotovaralis. Do they have any kind of structure, icosahedral or? Yeah, they, they have an icosahedral structure, and they have like kind of pentameric spikes. And it's thought that in these some distant evolutionary past, actually they're related to adenoviruses, because they have the capsid proteins have this adenoviral fold, which is different from the cotovaralis phages, which all have this herpes capsid fold. Uh, so there may be an some adenovirus is a Canadian That's adenovirus. Canadian, right? <laughs> That's right. Adenovirus, so. I've never worked on adenovirus. <laughs> <laughs> They're named after adenoids, so right. Yeah. Okay, so. adenoids. Adeno right. Adenoids. Right. I stand corrected. <laughs> so um, yeah. So there's a, in some date in some distant past there may be some evolutionary link there, um, but they are um, the way the way they infect the cell is uh, a, a little different than a uh, the way the cotovaralis do, because there's like a, uh, there's thought to be some kind of uh, lipid, like a, like, like a lipid fusion event, and there's like a little uh, part of the membrane that's inside the capsule, kind of blebs out, and fuses with the bacterial membrane, and that's how the DNA gets in, and the DNA packaging uh, pro enzyme actually stays with the virion uh, after packaging, unlike in the cotovaralis phases where that like falls off, uh, and then the tail goes on. So, but the cool thing is, every time we do one of these applied projects, which we think we're contributing to their, uh, to the growth or that, that those projects, we always get cool phage biology back. Right. And so ultimately, it, that's what so I care let, about. Let me so. just get this straight again. So the the outer part of it is actually a protein shell with spikes, yeah. and then this lipid stuff is so inside. The inside. Yeah. The, yeah. The, okay. Yeah. So, so there's a lipid it. tongue; it sticks out. Basically. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so if you take the, those viruses, if you chloroform treat them. Then they get inactivated, but then you can see that the, the one vertex has like this little lipid thing sticking out, right? And that's thought, that's like the infection apparatus. Uh, and they have this uh, protein primed uh, DNA replication, the covalently, uh, pro uh, proteins covalently linked to each end of the DNA. Very uh, much like for, Adeno then. Yeah. yeah so there's, there may be some very distant relationship there. But they lyse the cells like cotovaralis do, which they have like a regular kind of lysis cassette, the, the kind that Rise spent his whole life working on, that will you know, that opens up a hole in the membrane and, and, a, and, a, and a lysin comes out. And yeah, human adenoviruses have a death protein. They have a lysis protein. Right. So this rhodococcus phage you got from where? Where did you find it? It came from the soil, so it originally. It came from a gas station, didn't it? The gas station? Or the, Perfect. This one? <laughs> no, it did. Yeah. Next to the diesel pump. No, yeah. Pump. Right. So that's, what, cause that's, where you, that's where you find rhodococcus, right? So you can find all these kinds of bacteria that will grow on exotic carbon sources. I think it was horses, horses, right? summer students we sent out and they got, they were digging dirt around gas stations and yeah. things like that. So I can't remember if that came from a gas station or if it came from a sewage treatment plant, like the soil nearby inside the sewage treatment plant. Because that, that soil is constantly getting kind of sprinkled with sewage parts, right? But yeah, but so this, yeah, but as Rice says, a good example of where you have a, you know, you do these applied projects, right? But then, you know, once you go outside of E. coli and you're, you're, you're isolating phages against kind of weird bacteria like rhodococcus, you, you find all kinds of new and interesting things. And as far as we know, this is the first version of one of those viruses that will infect a, uh, an actinomycete bacteria, right? Which is like a mycolata, a mycobacterium, basically. Uh, the other ones, other ones have been found, but they infect either gram-negatives or uh, gram-positives. So the gist of it is that this phage then allows you to extract the uh, triacylglycerol. Yeah, so you can expose the cells that have accumulated the triacylglycerol uh, to the phage, and you and you get partial extraction. So I can't remember what the the efficiency. I think it's about fifty percent efficient okay. or something. I can't remember what the exact number was in the paper. Thirty percent is in the thirty percent. Okay, <laughs> so thirty percent efficient. But again, it's like you know that's kind of an entree into the into the area. So one of the, the issues, idea then is to find find additional phages or to modify this phage in a way to improve that yield. Yeah, or maybe just modify the protocol, perhaps. Okay. Uh, so increasing the salt concentration might help, for example, the the, the release. So is the uh, is the phage actually going through its full life cycle while you're doing this? Uh, yeah. So you get your reagent back amplified. Yeah. When you're done. Yeah. That's cool. Catal it's really cool. It's, it's yeah. better than catalytic. All right. yeah. <laughs> Exponential. So speaking of lysis, let's spend the rest of the time talking about that. Tell us about what you know, endolysins and holins and all that. In, in, uh, in 40 years as a faculty member and then a postdoc before that, ever since I studied lysis, routinely the organizers of, 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 uh, of uh, meetings say, you know, let's have Rye Young be the, the it's perfect. <laughs> lysis 
you give your talk and everybody leaves. So uh, <laughs> it's happened over and over again. They've all, they all came to the same conclusion. What's the best time to talk about lysis? The very last one. So I remember them rolling up at an ASM meeting, rolling up the carpet because it was the last <laughs> talk of the last meeting. We're going to stay. Oh, you're going to stay. So, well, they, they don't have to. So, we'll, so what do you want to know about lysis? So tell us how, what, what are endolysins and holins? And how so the holins, are the holins are the gods of uh, membrane proteins. So they... Uh, they're the most intelligent uh, peptides known to man, or known to, known to God or man. So they're the hole and grail. They are the hole and grail. <laughs> so, you probably uh, heard that one before, I'm guessing. No, but I'm going to oh. incorporate it in my <laughs> next review. <laughs> Your next seminar title. Do I have to cite you with that? I, no, 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 that's uh, all right. I give you the evidence that you came up with it. I'm screwed. It's a neurological <laughs> defect. It just yeah. generates this stuff. <laughs> so uh, essentially all... Uh, all Cotovoralis, all the double-stranded DNA phages that dominate the biosphere, as far as we can tell, when, they, uh, they, when they're in their infection cycle, they are, while they're making, assembling the, the phage uh, particle itself, replicating DNA, making the heads, the tails, the tail fibers, assembling everything, in parallel, th those are all separate pathways that are not regulated. People are really surprised to find this out, that all of these pathways have no, the head and the tail pathways are unrelated to each other. They just happen at, certain, at some rate. There's a fourth pathway after head, tail, and tail fiber. That's the lysis pathway. And that, in that lysis pathway, the holin protein, typically uh, uh, less than 60 to 100 amino acids, integral membrane protein, accumulates harmlessly in the cell, usually as a dimer floating around in the, in the membrane, doing absolutely nothing. The first rule of lysis is do no harm. Uh, because you don't want to have any toxicity while you're trying to make the most number of phage particles, right? And then at a program, that time that's programmed into the sequence of that holin, it'll suddenly aggregate and form enormous holes, micron scale holes, the largest holes known in biology, and the, through which the endolysis, the lysozyme, uh, uh, myrolytic activities then emerge uh, nonspecifically and attack the cell wall and then um, uh, if on a gram, in a gram-positive host, that's all there is because there isn't anything beyond that. So the holin controls when that happens, and therefore the holin controls the the fecundity of each infection cycle because if the holin decides to do it earlier, you get fewer phage particles, and you decide to do it later. So I've always been asked at some point, I said, well, why would you ever want to do it? Lambda, for example, the, the normal lambda, wild-type lambda, does this at exactly 50 minutes, 50 minutes, So and you get 100 phage particles. A long time ago, God decided we wanted it to be easy to remember. 50 minutes, 100 particles. But you can do a single amino acid change in the whole one and make that happen at 18 minutes or 12 minutes or 75 minutes or any time you want. In fact, I think I have one. You name a time, I can give you a, a whole one. And so uh, the next question you should ask is, well, why don't, why don't you go to 60 minutes? You'd make another 50 phage particles. Okay, so it turns out that predator-prey theory people figured that out a long time ago. So if you're a phage particle and you're in a uh, in a in a uh, in a in a target poor environment, you want to have uh, you want to stay. Once you start that infection, you want to get the absolute maximum number of phage particles you can because you don't know where your next infection is going to come from. So that tends to push the whole to, to mutate to longer and longer times. So if you expose lambda to a target poor environment for a long period of time, it'll it'll get longer and longer life cycles. In contrast, if you provided a rich environment, target rich environment, the exact opposite will happen because you want to it's, get to your next host. Yeah, because now even if you only get 30 phages out, they each get a new uh, host, and so you exponential. Right. You do exponential rather than, and so the, this this fantastic little protein has controls this uh, environmentally, you know, global. Um, the fecundity of all phage infections. This is determined by these little proteins, and they're enormously Diverse. The last time I did a search uh, on Holins, uh, there I think we it, with the with the what's the database that only has you know their unique. What you know, what, Uniprot. Yeah, no, there's a unique the, RefSeq. There's no, there's another another database now where where where, where there's only every every uh, the every, every sequence is unique. So you if you have two copies of it. They don't count as two. There's only one, right? Two identical sequences. Well, that's like NCBL. We have the WIP numbers now. Yeah, something like that. So anyway, there were thirty thousand different Holin sequences, and I checked the, like the first ten, and none of them were even related to each other. So I don't know. Some of them are only one amino acid difference, but there are thousands and thousands and thousands of unrelated Holin sequences that have 
uh, and, and their membrane proteins. So everybody here who's had a little bit of biology knows membrane proteins have alpha helical transmembrane domains, and Holins exist with essentially any topology that you want, which tells you indirectly they're not even related to each other because they didn't, you know. So it's, they're, they're, they are a source of endless fascination. And uh, How does the timing work? That's, that's uh, NIH is, they continually fund me now for 40 years, and I still don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> they never learn. Uh, yeah. so, you say you can't, so you classify them, there, there's this incredible diversity of Holins, and I assume that they're, they fall into the Holin category based on function? Yep. Okay. So the, the way they work is that they, um, empirically, we see them in, in using various types of physical and, and, and uh, microscopic studies. The Holin proteins stay disperse and, and motile, mobile in the membrane, and then when they reach a critical concentration, they then aggregate into large two-dimensional arrays, and then they go through the, we think they actually collapse the membrane potential as a result of it, and then that causes them to rearrange into these large holes. Changes that, affects that. that critical concentration, this concept was actually invented by Karana for it to explain why bacterial rhodopsin goes from its, its, um, its uh, soluble, freely mobile phase into suddenly assembling into the purple membrane. This so it's almost the, like a protein level quorum sensing. Uh, yep, and there's actually one uh, Holon, the, f the famous phage T4 Holon, that actually listens to quorum sensing to dis determine whether or not it's time. It, it, it wants to know to determine are the there any hosts out there? If not, I'm not. If there's no hosts out there, I'm not going to pull the plug. So I think that's really cool. Holons are smart on top of being, you know. Okay, so then old. once that hole is formed, then how does the rest of the process so the lysozyme comes out, and if, if in a gram positive uh, organism at that point the cell wall is degraded and the, and the cell blows up, the osmotic pressure release is catastrophic. But in gram negatives, we've uh, discovered that there uh, that you also have to disrupt the outer membrane, which was very surprising to us and something I actually didn't believe for a long time. But uh, it turns out that if you don't disrupt the outer membrane, which means you hold, need another whole system, whole being a bad pun, uh, but you need another system to disrupt the outer membrane, um, then, uh, then the cells are trapped, the phages are trapped in a cell that has no cell wall and is dead, which is the worst possible situation, but is stuck inside this outer membrane. So there, it turns out that the phages have developed at least three different ways of doing that, and uh, maybe many more. Can you, can you explain how if you have abundant bacterial populations, how that selects for more rapidly expressing Holins? Well, so if there's lots of targets, uh, then the phage, if a phage is, a progeny uh, emanate from a lysing cell, they don't spend any time, dwell time, waiting, looking or waiting mm -hmm. to, to absorb, to, they instantly are absorbed and they start new infections. And so you go from 30 to 30 to 30 in, in uh, in 35 minute chunks, if you work out the math, that's a lot better than doing 50 twice, right? So it's, a, it's an exponential thing. So, but, uh, but you can't go too fast, because if you, the first phage particle in a lambda infection doesn't appear until 20 minutes. So you, if you do it before 20 minutes, you get you know, a Humpty Dumpty is, uh, is broken. So. so if you go in, in, in nature, look in areas rich or poor in bacteria, do you get different kinds of holins? Uh, different kinds of holins, yes, but. Uh, what I so, meant is different timed. Yeah, the, so that there's nobody's done that experiment perfectly, but there have been uh, people have shown with T4 they've shown that if you take a long time hole in and a short time hole in, just alleles of the same phage or for same same gene, uh, one does better in dense cultures, one does a lot better in in. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so sure. that's been done, and then there's sort of a bioinformatic correlation if you look at. Uh, it's been done in, by uh, colleagues of mine in Mexico where they look they actually sequenced a lot of lambda-like phages, and uh, they sequenced the lambda holin gene, the S gene, that I spent so much time on, and, they, and the, the alleles they come up with in the sewers are all much uh, uh, faster lysing alleles that, uh, based on, because their sewers are really, apparently really good for this kind of thing. So. <laughs> and if you did it in the oceans, you would find slower yeah, ones? Yeah, probably. I'd, I'd like to, uh, that, that nobody, I've not been able to get any ocean people to do lysis experiments yet, so maybe some people will hear this. Uh, Curtis. Or maybe forest. Yeah, they, I, I, I've, I've tried to get them interested, but they're more interested in coral. So, uh. right. Uh, so you said there are three ways to lyse. This is one of them. What are the others? So the three ways are there. there the whole in the endolysis story is pretty much uniform. There's some variations on it, but um, the, uh, the the three different ways I was talking about is how you get rid of the outer membrane, which okay. turns out to be topologically difficult. 
because, and it turns out that remarkably, the most common way so far that we found is that the phages actually make uh, proteins that that span the entire uh, envelope. So they have a uh, they have a transmembrane domain in the um, uh, they have a protein that has a transmembrane domain, and they have another protein that's an outer membrane lipoprotein, protein, and they form a complex, and they sit there and they wait until the holon acts. They do nothing first, do no harm, right? They, they do nothing until the holon triggers, the endolysin comes out, degrades the cell wall. Now these guys, which had been trapped in this meshwork of the pivotal glycan, they uh, reorganize, and, it, and, and our uh, model, which is supported by considerable uh, biochemical and physical and uh, biological data, is they actually fuse the inner and outer membrane. So it's actually, the member, outer membrane is not destroyed, it's actually simply fused with the inner membrane, and so you create these these perfect fusion events that where now you have five os osmotic uh, 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 atmospheric pressures versus the environment as so you get an explosion. So that's uh, that's been our coolest thing in the last few years has been working on that. And then there's another method of lysis involving inhibition of murine synthesis as well. So that's uh, that's another story. So my second favorite phage uh, is uh, is a phage called Q-beta. So it's, right. it, it, arguably, Q-beta and MS2, the two famous single-stranded RNA phages, these are examples of the simplest phages. They're single-stranded RNAs. They're just messenger RNAs. They have three genes, one for the coat protein, one for the uh, single molecule tail that recognizes their target, and then the last protein is the, is the RNA-dependent replicate. So these are truly simple organisms. And they have to lyse the cell too, and it turns out they all, almost all of them have, in, have evolved another lysis gene, and they, uh, because the, 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 there's no room to expand, in, every, in essentially every case, the lysis gene is an outer frame, reading frame, at some place in one of those three core genes. And it turns out that the most common uh, purpose, uh, function of those, we call them single gene lysis systems, since they are very different from the other ones that we we're talking about for, uh, for large double-strand DNA phages, uh, these single gene lysis systems uh, attack uh, cell wall homeostasis or biosynthesis. So we've recent, recently shown that, uh, that they inhibit, in some cases, they actually inhibit individual steps in the cell wall pathway. So the, the little virus, viral protein binds to that enzyme, inhibits it, and, that, and the cell basically is the same as giving it penicillin. So it dies and blows up. These are novel mechanisms. They're different from penicillin, right? Well, yeah, penicillin uh, affects uh, uh, the uh, peptoglycan biosynthesis apparatus on the outside of the cell. These are all steps in the pathway to provide the substrates for the cell wall biosynthesis. And you found multiple steps, Yes, there's, right? there's, so far we've found and for small viruses, we found four different ones. So, so it's sufficient just to disrupt cell wall biosynthesis. If you for growing cells, this has been known for antibiotics uh, for a long time. There are many cell wall antibiotics. Uh, those always work on growing cells, and that's the same thing with our, these types of RNA phages that we call these protein antibiotics. Uh, they um, that, that's how they work. There are so phenomenologically, this must the lysis process must look different. Like it does. It, the cells, they, the, if you're inhibiting cell wall biosynthesis by either an antibiotic like penicillin or by using one of these particular types of single gene lysis systems, the cells actually look uh, blow up by blebbing out at the, at, the sept, at the septum. So it's very characteristic. They just the big bulge comes out and then they blow up. How, how big is this lysin protein? Oh, there are some. The smallest one we found so far is 23 amino acids. So it's hard to develop big genes inside other genes without disrupting. So but it's, it's it's translated by frame shifting of. No, it's a, they have their own ribosome binding site. Binding site. Okay, I forgot it's a bacteria, right? Yeah. Um, and can you make a small molecule that mimics the effect of these? There are. Uh, uh, one company has expressed interest, but I have not seen the money yet. So <laughs> <laughs> I think you could because they all um, make intimate contact with these enzymes. Right. And um, so, by the way, when I went to Columbia in 1982, Saul Spiegelman, Fred Kramer, Don Mills were all there working on Cubeta. Yeah, that's a fantastic system. They did in in, vivo, in test tube evolution. Right, it was amazing, amazing experiments. And the coolest thing there is that. This is used as evidence that evolution doesn't have to become more complex, right? Because right. if you put this replicon of Q-beta in a cell-free system, you select for smaller RNAs right. that have an advantage. And in, in it's an RNA-dependent RNA replicate, so right. you need one, uh, 
Right. That's a fantastic. Sentence. Oh, and you know, there are two more things I wanted to ask you. You know, cool. You should ask him some. Well, he he talked a lot, but you could if you want. Here's a cool one. Maybe you could talk about this. So the 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 acinetobacter plaques they have a clear they have a halo around them, mm -hmm. which is because of an enzyme that can degrade polysaccharides. Yeah. Tell tell us that. That sounds cool. All right. So that's that's uh, that was Adriana's uh, actually Adriana who who was instrumental in the Patterson intervention. That was before we were contacted about Tom Patterson. That was, that was her project. Uh, supposed to be, that was, you know, that was what she was working on. Uh, and so that was a phase that was isolated a number of years ago in the lab by a former postdoc uh, named Tom Jin Wood. And she isolated this phage and it has this expanding halo around the plaque. So what you get is you have a lot of bacteria, you have a clear plaque, and you'll have this kind of turbid zone around it. And if you kind of leave that on the bench, you know, come back the next day, that kind of, that turbid zone will be bigger. And it have this, they call this kind of expanding translucent halo. And that can be indicative of there being a, uh, what's called a capsular depolymerase enzyme that's produced by the phage. And so that's known in like, uh, it's been known for a long time. And you, there's a classic E. coli phages that do this as well. Uh, and so this is a, it, it's a, an infection mechanism where these are actually the tail fibers of the phage. And they have this enzymatic activity that they're able to uh, degrade the bacterial capsule. And they so, drill down through the thing. And so they drill down. There's actually the famous paper by Bayer from, I think, the 60s, where it has like these great EMs of like a section and you, of the phage infecting. You can see there's like the bacterial cell. And nobody in the podcast can see my hands moving, but there's a bacterial cell and this capsule. And you can see the phage are just kind of drilling down through the capsule towards the surface. And so it's thought that this translucent halo then is the bacteria that have, they're alive in the lawn, but they've had all their cap capsule chewed off because when the cells lice, you know, so you're making the, the phage and you're making tail fibers, but not, not every tail fiber is, is assembled onto a phage. When, the, when the, at the time of lysis, you have a lot of kind of partially assembled phage parts that come out too, which would include extra tail fibers. And, and these e have- And extra depolymerases. And probably. extra depolymerases, yeah. yeah. So and that's those, those enzymes. Uh, and so, um, and those have, have activity on their own. So um, Adriana was able to express those. Actually, they, they actually express really well. Uh, in just in a pet vector, and you can get pretty high yields, and it's pretty soluble and stays active. Uh, and so um, we're actually collaborating with a group at UTMB right now, uh, Peter Lyman and, and uh, Mikhail Schneider and his group. In Galveston. Group. Yeah, so that's, sorry, in Galveston. It's the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. Uh, and they're working on getting a crystal structures of these, uh, of these proteins. So it's, uh, they're a neat class of, of enzymes because they're very specific and they degrade bacterial capsule, and there's been some interest about maybe using these as therapeutics uh, on their own, because if you, if you can just chew off the capsule, uh, but not, uh, that would, might have a benefit. But then also it's just interesting phage biology as well, because you know these phages, they have a strategy for dealing with bacterial capsule, which is normally protective of the surface, which is just to, to chew it all off. Right. So then that's diffusing out, and that's what's giving you that expanding hey. turbid yeah. Yeah. That's halo. The, that's the model. Okay. Uh, so I don't think it's ever been explicitly proven, but that, that makes sense. So the fa the phages probably halo. can't. So it's the tail wagging the fog is um, ex expanding out from there. Yeah. But then the, the phage presumably is also going to spread out, and the plaque would get bigger. Um, actually, well, some phages do, and some phages don't, because the, uh, the, the growth phase, a lot of bacteria, a lot of phages won't grow on the uh, in, in the physiological conditions of, of like late stationary phase or early stationary oh, phase, like lambda, okay. for, lambda right. plaques right. reach a certain size and they quit. Right. But the famous phage T1, which has caused more damage than any other phage, you know, it's airborne ly lytic phage, those plaques just get bigger and bigger right. and bigger and they'll eat okay. your whole plate up. So Yeah, and T7's like that too. So it's true. Most phages that you deal with have like, they're, they're only able really to replicate in, uh, in growing in cells. Growing cells. So it's, it's become self-limiting. Yeah, and so uh, once the cells reach stationary phase, the phage replication stops. But there's some phages like T7 or T1 uh, where you can you can get, you can put T7 into a stationary phase culture and it will lice that. Right. The the number of phages produced per burst is a little less, but it still is able to do it, which is a kind of an interesting thing because you think if you know this this is a potential host pool, right? So how right. come all phages don't do that, right? You'd think any every phage would want to be able to lice the the stationary phase population and make more phages, but T7 does, and most phages like T4 for example, lambda don't. And so there's there's a, a an evolutionary choice made there, right? And that's that, that's another interesting kind of unsolved. Well, in the case of a lysogenic phage, you could make the evolutionary choice to hole up inside the bacteria yeah. while they're in stationary phase, and then wait for a more favorable environment before yeah. finding a new host. Yeah, I had to bring this up because not only do we like plaques here on Twiv, but plaques are great. Your turbid plaque. Yes, yeah, turbid plaque. Dot com. My, my, my 
kind of dormant <laughs> science below. One more thing. Notice you published a structure of Cubeta a couple of years ago. Uh, was that well, exciting to you to that, see that? It was exciting primarily because that was the main work product of uh, Dr. Junji Zhang, who was our fourth uh, hire right. uh, in the in the Phage Center. So he's uh, he's an incredibly talented young scientist, and his he uh, if you've ever read Alice in Wonderland, if you have a glimpse of Junji, all you will see is his smiling teeth. So, <laughs> he's he's the smiliest person I've ever known, and. Uh, and he does fantastic uh, structural biology. And in every case, when I said that, that's not possible, he immediately showed it was. I don't know why I'm co-author on that, because I think everything that was demonstrated in there, I didn't believe. <laughs> <laughs> what part of it? I mean, I didn't believe it could be done. Ah. So uh, he, he uh, the one, one, one finding was, uh, was that there are actually two copies of the coat protein, which is nor normally, Back in the, in the very old days, we thought that there was, it's a T equals three uh, symmetry. So we expect there to be 180 copies of the coprotein, especially in, uh, uh, and then there was always the issue of where the single molecule tail, it's a big protein at 45,000, where it would be. So the I, I, original idea was it would be right in the, on one, one uh, vertex or right in the middle of one of the vertex pentamers. But it turns out that uh, the, 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 this, this special protein, the A protein, actually takes the place of two of five coat proteins in a pentamer, which is to be the wrong answer on a molecular biology exam. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's not, yep. you can't do that, right? Yeah. So there's no way to, no way to assemble it that way. And so, um, and that it turns out to be true for all these, uh, uh, as far as we can tell, for all these single strand RNA phages. But Q beta, in addition, apparently two of those Coproteins are now are assembled on the inside of the virus, so it actually has the right number of coproteins. It's, and it's, as far as I know, the only example of uh, coproteins found internal to a virion in any virus. Mm -hmm. So what, what the heck they're there? doing there? I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't. I have no idea. And one of the things that I love about that structure, I got to talk to Junji this morning, was being able to see the structure of the RNA yeah. inside. Because I've always wondered about that. My question to him was. Uh, you know, we have all these models of secondary structure of the RNA. Are they true? And as far as he can tell so far, yeah. And that's, yeah. that's comforting. But now you get to see the tertiary structure as well. And it's terrific. Yeah, it's amazing. And this little protein on the outside, what is the name of that one? A2? It's called A2 for historical reasons. And tr traditionally, in those levy viruses, they're, they're called A for attachment or MAT for maturation. But they're they're the proteins. These, these viruses are so simple. They don't have a tail. So how do they get their nucleic acid into the cell? It turns out they all target retractable pili. So in the case mm -hmm. of Cubeta, it's the mm -hmm. F pillus. Right. But now, basically, every time somebody has a retractable pillus system, type 4 or whatever, if you look for them, you'll find RNA phages that are, and they use, somehow use the retractable apparatus to get the RNA into the, into the cell. Yeah, he told me that really the, cool. as the pili go in and it pulls out the A protein, the RNA that, comes out. That's our model, and they, it, it, we, it pulls the, we're sticking to it, too. It, we're, it pulls the A protein and the RNA into right. the cell. Which is cool. Amazing. And then the other part that he told me about, which was cool, the assembly. The, want to tell us the story? Well, so so it, uh, the order of events isn't clear, but it, it looks like that the when the RNA folds up, it creates many, it has at least one major um, place of secondary structure, which is known as the coat repressor uh, site. But the coat proteins bind there, but they're also, as it folds, the coat uh, assembles in the T equals three symmetry, but there are secondary structures that are clearly involved. And so they, cool. this is a case where the RNA is part of the structure, not just a, a information load. So that coat repressor site is nucleates the capsid assembly, is that right? That, that secondary structure where the coat binds, yeah. Okay, cool. That, that we don't know the actual order of assembly, right. so it's... So Q-beta, I've, I've always thought about since I was a postdoc, because I work on polio. It's a plus strand RNA virus with similar genome organization. And the polymerase of Cubeta takes subunits from the host, ribosomal protein subunits. And for many years... E EFTU, EFTS, and S1. Exactly. Yeah. So we use that as a model for understanding polio polymerase because for many years we thought the same happened. It probably does, but we don't know what the proteins are. And the second, of course, is that for Cubeta, it was the first virus for which an infectious copy of the genome as DNA was made, 1976. Mm -hmm. By Taniguchi, I Vincent think. Vincent is really into infectious clones. Yeah. <laughs> MS2 was the first genome sequence. Right. So um, it was the first um, 
uh, it was the first genome sequence, and uh, and I think Cubeta, like you said, was the first DNA copy of right. that made. There's other, another unique thing about MS2. Well, of course, MS2 sequencing was done by RNA sequencing, which was much different right. from right. you know the nearest neighbor approach. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that is uh, a nice twiv there on phages. You like that? All phage, all the time. <laughs> so get your fill of phage. Well, that's a good one. Get your fill of phage. All right, so where can you find TWIV? Apple Podcasts. That used to be iTunes. Microbe.tv slash TWIV. If you have a phone, you've got a podcast player, search for TWIV. Please subscribe. Even if you don't want to listen, please subscribe. subscribe. Let it download so we get the numbers. It's all about the numbers, okay? You know, a lot of CNN's ratings are that people leave the TV on playing to an empty room. So if you want to just play TWIV to an empty room, that's fine. And we love getting questions and comments at TWIV. We usually answer them, although not at an event like this. TWIV at microbe.tv. If you really like us, consider supporting us financially. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. There are a number of different ways you can do that, including Patreon. It helps us travel. It helps us uh, pay for our costs as well. Our guests today have been from the Center for Phage Technology here at Texas A&M University. Jason Gill, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having me. And Ra Young, thank you. And can I add a, a, my thanks to you guys and also to uh, Justin Levitt and Jolene Ramsey, the postdocs who set this whole thing up. So You bet. Indeed. Um, I, I was going to thank them as well, and we will. <laughs> and a TWIV, by the way, is Kathy Spindler from the University of Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is really a lot of fun. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. And I just, I really thank everybody here. This has been a great day. Has been. Really a wonderful day. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. He's also on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank Jolene Ramsey for organizing this. Thank you very much. I want to thank Texas A&M for hosting us. And Justin Levitt, Adriana, Carolina, Hernandez, Morales. Pretty good, right? Thank you very much. I'd like to thank ASM for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the introductory music. Uh, Carolina, would you mind picking up that shirt and giving it to um, Kathy over there? And, and there's the one, one in front that of Rich. Rich. The one that Rich dropped. Yeah, there's <laughs> one that Rich, because we're going to now throw these to you in, in view of your patients sitting here. How do you do Someone this? Do it. Last time we did this, it? Alan and I threw two at the same person. You remember yes. that? Yeah, we managed to nail the same person. We have a horrible track record for these. A, uh, Don't throw your elbow out. First time we did stuffed microbes, I was afraid I might have broken somebody's nose, but oh, it turned out. There were some tailed phages that got thrown. They were really Oh, yeah. They're yeah, never they going to reach you. I'm going to knot this one up, see if I can get it out there. It hits the ceiling. Nice. Wow, that's oh. pretty good. Yeah. Hey. All right. Uh, you'll be in the orthopedist's office tomorrow. That's for sure. <laughs> so I know football is big here. I'm trying to compress this down. We'll see if I can put a spiral on it. Whoa, oh. good one. Okay, okay, there we go. <laughs> All right. If you guys want to take that one, you, you can guys throw want it. To, uh, figure out who's Rye or uh, Jason, who's got the better arm? Oh, I can't do it. So, yeah, but um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm 46. In hexadecimal. So. <laughs> <laughs> Jason? Let me wrap this up then. So you, is, there, is there a folding Better technique you need for this? No, to, not in particular. Just when I turned 60, it was a million in uh, base 10, I think. Base 10. Yeah. Base 2. Right. Base 2, right. Hey. I never played football. So. <laughs> I didn't either. You could probably tell that by looking at me. You, know, you have to go up there and get better, better range. Oh, well, I'm plugged in here. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if I can get around. You can here. unplug that can little guy. That. Yeah, just push, push, push the, the little, yeah, push, push the, the button. button. And, um, oh, it's locked. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Get some by the long distance people. Let's see a riot. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's too far away. <laughs> oh, that's pretty, that's pretty <laughs> pathetic. Who else wants oh, one? Yeah. I can't look because it would bias. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. You, you, not done yet. 
You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>